It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Thought Leaders Lecture Series, hosted by Space Center Houston and supported by UTMB Health. I am Dr. Janet Sutherland, Vice President of Interprofessional Education, Institutional Effectiveness, and the Health Education Center. Tonight's topic is virtual reality. For many of us, virtual reality still conjures up thoughts of sci-fi or video gaming, but it's very much a part of modern life and growing in importance as new uses for technology are developed and refined. In healthcare, simulation-based training is a long-standing practice. UTMB is home to one of the nation's premier simulated learning environments for health profession students. And like NASA, we are strong advocates for using technology-enhanced simulations, including virtual reality and augmented reality, as training tools. In medicine, like in space, virtual reality can provide a realistic and risk-free environment for trainees to perfect their skills, to identify potential issues, and to develop and test solutions. Tonight, we will hear from three engaging speakers. NASA's renowned storyteller, Dylan Mathis, Integration Manager of External Relations for the International Space Station Program and the Commercial Crew Program at Johnson Space Center. Josh Rubin, Co-Founder and CEO of Z3VR, developer of extended reality tools that analyze micro-movements in the eye to detect neurocognitive conditions, and Angelica Garcia, simulation software and virtual reality engineer with CACI at Johnson Space Center. Six years ago, VR pioneer Res Sithu described virtual reality as an exciting and frightening experiment. She went on to predict that virtual reality would be the way we will start breaking new ground and challenging the norms. In both medicine and space exploration, Ms. Sid Hughes' predictions have rung true. Thank you for joining me to learn more about this exciting, perhaps frightening, and incredibly powerful tool, so important to education and discovery. Enjoy the lecture. Hello, I'm William T. Harris, President and CEO of Space Center Houston, a dynamic science and space exploration learning destination and nonprofit science center. We also have the privilege of serving as the official visitor center for NASA Johnson Space Center. We share the story of human space exploration, past, present, and future, with more than 1.25 million visitors annually from around the world. Thank you for joining Space Center Houston's Thought Leader Series program, Virtual Reality Applications in Space, presented by University of Texas Medical Branch. Our Thought Leader Series brings you space and science experts from across the country who provide insights and perspectives on space exploration. Space Center Houston offers robust learning experiences that enable you to be a part of NASA's mission. In addition to our extensive collections, you can experience new exhibits and live programming, so there's always something new. Now on to our program. Virtual reality technology has been used for many years to train astronauts to conduct spacewalks, payload operations, and extravehicular activity. Now scientists and engineers are pushing the capabilities of this technology to explore the physiological effects of space on the human body. In our discussion, we'll learn about the intersection of virtual reality and space and what this technology can reveal about the human body and mind. I'm delighted to welcome our panelists for virtual reality applications in space presented by UTMB. Our first presenter is Angelica Garcia, who is a simulation and software engineer lead at CICI International Incorporated, supporting NASA Johnson Space Center in the virtual reality training laboratory. She leads the development and deployment of lunar exploration and visualization tools using immersive technologies. And Helica also maintains, deploys, and modifies immersive simulation systems and the tools used to train astronauts. And Helica earned a master's in modeling and simulation from the University of Central Florida and a bachelor's in aerospace engineering from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Our second presenter is Josh Rubin, who is the co-founder and chief executive officer of Z3VR, where he develops extended reality tools that analyze micro movements in the eye to passively detect neurocognitive conditions. 
Josh has a passion for neuroscience and digital health and serves in various volunteer positions for organizations in the greater Houston area. Our third presenter is Dylan Mathis, who is the Integration Manager for External Relations Office at NASA Johnson Space Center for the International Space Station Program and Commercial Crew Program. Dylan is responsible for all ISS and Commercial Crew Program communications. He leads the teams of storytellers that share with the world what it's really like to be an astronaut and live in space on the International Space Station. Dylan earned bachelor's and master's degrees focused on high definition television, digital communication, and multimedia from Baylor University. Each of our panelists will now provide some background about their kind of research and their interests. And after that, we'll have a discussion. I'm really looking forward to today's program. So first we'll hear from Angelica. Thank you, William. I wanted to talk to you guys today about the Virtual Reality Lab at Johnson Space Center, as well as our Prototype Immersive Technologies Lab, which is the labs that I work with and support on the day-to-day -day in my work. So a little bit of brief history on the lab and how we really got started with virtual reality. Believe it or not, the lab started back in the 90s. We started developing graphics to help crew visualize how to repair the Hubble telescope way back in the day. So as the years went on and the station started being put together, actually engineers at the VR lab started putting together those CAD models and started also developing something that today we call Doug. And Doug is a graphics engine that we actually use today to run a lot of our simulations, um, it runs a lot of our graphics for various applications, not just here in Johnson Space Center, but around NASA and different centers as well. So Doug is a, like a game engine. Um, if you are really into gaming, you might be familiar with Unity or Unreal. Doug's kind of like that, but it was custom built here at JSC by our engineers at the Virtual Reality Lab to help us simulate and also visualize the International Space Station as well as um, different graphical scenarios. So what you're seeing right now is a video of how we use Doug to animate spacewalks. So we get a set of very detailed procedures and we put these procedures together visually and then we deploy them to the International Space Station. We actually work with a great team of engineers who create the very detailed procedures planned for the spacewalks. Um, then we animate them and we make sure that the astronauts at the space station have these visuals in order to refresh on what they're supposed to do when they come outside to perform these spacewalks and get more familiar with some of the very details of those spacewalks. So it's a great tool not to just do that, but also it helps us run the graphics for a lot of our simulations. And those simulations will give you kind of a brief overview of what they are. We use these graphics for several different simulation systems. One of them is mass handling. So mass handling is actually a robot that we have at the virtual reality lab. It's called Charlotte because if you can kind of see in these images, it has a bunch of strings coming out of the center box. Um, the strings, if you're visualizing it right in front of the robot, it kind of looks like a spider web. So we called it Charlotte, like Charlotte's web. This robot helps us simulate large payloads in zero G. So if an astronaut comes in, they can put on a headset and with the headset, they can visualize a large payload anywhere on the truss of the International Space Station. So virtually they see that payload or let that large mass that they will be moving. But physically, they're actually controlling this robot. So they have physical handrails that they can grab onto and they can move the robot wherever they need to move to place it in the correct interface. Uh, so they can get that physical feedback of how the masses are interacting in the center of gravity of that payload and virtually they can see what they would be expected to move um, in the International Space Station during their spacewalk. So that's one of our systems. Our next system is um, a little bit weird how, how we define it. We call it the robotic hardware checkout, um, but we really use a robotic workstation for training and we integrate virtual reality in it. 
So as you can see in several of these images, both the one on the left and on the right, we have astronauts looking at our robotic workstation. And that robotics workstation uses Doug, our graphics engine, but also it's integrating into VR, so the people that you see in the middle. So we can have a group of astronauts controlling their robotic arm through our simulation, and that's integrated with our virtual reality scene. So the astronauts in virtual reality can be moved around using that robotic arm in different workstations outside of the station virtually. We can have one person at the end of the robotic arm, and then we can have someone else near a work site um, of interest, depending on the scenario for the spacewalk. So this training really helps them visualize what their work site might be, practice how to move the robotic arm, but most importantly, practice communication between someone that's expected to be outside performing that spacewalk attached to the robotic arm and the crew actually moving the robotic arm inside of the station. Keep in mind that when someone's outside in space being controlled by someone inside of the International Space Station, their reference frames are completely different. So someone could be telling them, hey, I need to move forward. Well, that forward or, you know, a little bit up towards my head can mean something completely different to someone in a different orientation inside of the station controlling that arm. So that's why this training is very important and it's really helpful when astronauts come in and practice robotics and be able to see and visualize all of these things in virtual reality. Uh, so be fully immersed and also be able to see the entire International Space Station. The last training system that I actually work very closely with is SAFER training. So SAFER stands for Simplified Aid for EVA Rescue, which is basically just the jetpack system that astronauts have attached to their suit, their space walking suits. And so this system is a redundant system for safety. We never really want them to ever be, be deploying the system. It's in order to rescue themselves if at any moment during their spacewalk they became detached and they're floating away from station and from structure. So you can see kind of how this training is done at the VR lab. We put a headset on, we can simulate different speeds at which an astronaut can be detached from station and rotate at completely different rates. Then they have to power on their hand controller, their safer hand controller, and they have to learn how to efficiently fly back to station. So we have the ability to do this multiple times with many different configurations of station. We can place them anywhere around the structure. We can also turn off all the lights to simulate a night pass. We can add different weights to the suit to simulate that they have extra tools attached that they did not get rid of. Um, we can change the rates, like I mentioned before, so have them separate slower, have them separate a little bit faster. We can control all of that. The really cool thing about the system is that we actually deploy a version of it in space. So as you can see here, this virtual reality trainer was the first virtual reality system in space. It's basically a laptop on the head, and that's actually the nickname we gave it. It's the laptop that they use on station, or in this case, they used to use on station. And we customized a hood with some lenses, and they are using Doug um, with a, a hand controller to simulate flying themselves back to station. So this is a refresh training system. So between the time astronauts actually train at the VR lab here at Johnson Space Center, get to fly to station and then perform a spacewalk, it could be a couple of months away, um, maybe a year. And so we really want them to be very efficient at flying in case they were ever to need the system. So this is why the system was developed and deployed. The extra cool thing about the system is that we have a brand new virtual reality trainer that we deployed in 2018. Uh, we upgraded the hardware. We're no longer using a laptop on the head. Um, we are using an Oculus system, a modified Oculus to work in zero G and a hand controller to do that refresh training. So this is what we use today and how we're continuously using virtual reality on the International Space Station.
So now let's shift to some of the newer stuff. I talked about everything we're doing to support the International Space Station, uh, spacewalks operations, and space missions today with our astronauts and how we train them at the Virtual Reality Lab. But we're also continuously working on figuring out how we're going to support lunar missions. We are getting ready for Artemis 1. We are getting ready to put boots on the ground. So things that we're doing um, to actively uh, prepare and set our systems up so that we can in the future train crew um, is a lot of validation. We want to be able to visualize where we can potentially land. A lot of the issues of the proposed landing sites are the lighting conditions. We can have either a lot of darkness or very bright lighting conditions. And so we are actively trying to figure out how to better visualize that and how that can be helpful, not just for training, but for analysis today as well. So some of the things we're doing is we're exploring our different game engines and their capabilities of being able to render and simulate these shadows. So this is an image of some of the things we're doing with the lunar reconnaissance orbital images and how we're trying to recreate them in different game engines like Doug, which in this image is labeled as Edge, Unity, Unreal. So we're really actively trying to figure out what the best methods are to render not just the terrain, but also the lighting conditions. So not just different tests with different game engines, but also different tests and validation. So the next couple of images will really show you how we're trying to validate. We obviously have never been to the South Pole. I don't know what it looks like. No one really knows what it looks like besides the data that we collect from satellites. So we are trying to use different methods to validate these lighting conditions. Some of the methods include um, getting pictures from the Apollo missions and trying to replicate those pictures in our current game engines and see how similar we can recreate the shadows, how similar can we see the terrain in the far distance, how can we replicate some of those textures um, of the lunar uh, terrain and the lunar surface, and how can we compare them and validate to what we have today on our game engines. Another uh, good example of some of the validation work we're doing is getting different images from our lighting lab and trying to replicate that as well. So what we have today is we have collected a bunch of data from LRO, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and a great group of scientists and engineers have helped us process this data. And now we're able to import it to our game engine. This is actually being used um, in Unreal for this video. And we can simulate different lighting conditions around that area of interest for our landing sites. So you can see how in this video we are moving around the sun and the shadows are updating and changing. So we're adding a lot of different features to these applications so that we can use it for planning and visualizing and just making sure that we're standardizing our tools today so that we're able to use them in the future. So all of our newer applications are using all this data in this terrain. Um, one of the cool applications that we're using besides uh, the desktop tool is this tool that we call LAVA. It's lunar assessments with VR assets. And we've been using this to run some human in the loop tests. Um, and in this video, you can see that we have a fully immersive system where we can actually have two people or more than two people in virtual reality and we can walk around the lunar surface, we can pick up rocks, we can climb up lander stairs, we can interact with other uh, people in the simulation, we can jump on the rover and drive the rover around different craters um, and interact with the lighting conditions. So we are trying to replicate the lighting conditions, not just on the lunar terrain, but also on the suit. So what the suit lights look like, will it be enough to visualize things in full shadows um, and things like that. The same terrain is actually being used and integrated into Argos. So I believe a couple of weeks back, you guys 
learned about Argos or seen videos about Argos. Argos is an offload system. It helps us simulate um, microgravity. And so in this video, we actually have integrated virtual reality. So the lunar scene that you just saw, but we integrated it with the Argo system. So you can physically simulate lunar gravity and then virtually visualize being on the lunar terrain. So we're constantly trying to push the boundaries of all of the technologies um, to see if we can integrate full body tracking to be able to visualize your, your feet, your arms, your, your fingers, your hands, um, but also put people in lunar gravity and see how useful that is for future training purposes, um, but also for planning and, and organizing what we're going to do once we get there. So this is probably one of my favorite um, technology integration systems, uh, being able to just not just hang out in the, in the moon in VR, but also be able to be in microgravity at Argos. So as you can see, we're always looking ahead. We are, of course, always supporting our current astronauts and our mission at the ISS, but we're always looking forward to see how we can help, how we can visualize the future, and how we can make the lives of our crew um, better once we get to the moon, before we get to the moon, and make sure that we prepare for what's to come. Well, thank you so much, Angelica. That was absolutely fascinating, and I loved the imagery of the South Pole of the Moon. Just as a reminder for our viewers, the Artemis program focus is on having astronauts go to the South Pole of the Moon for extended periods of time where we think there is frozen water ice. And so it's really important to understand this landscape and there are a whole new set of challenges for exploring that part of lunar surface. We'll now hear from Josh. So I, I'd like to start off by just giving a, a quick thank you to Space Center Houston. Um, I've been an avid visitor for the last six or seven years, and I've learned so much from you guys. So thanks so much for having me today. Um, I guess I, I, I would like to start off by giving a quick introduction of, of Z3VR, um, just to go into a little more depth about what it is that we do. So um, Z3 was founded about six years ago, um, really as a company we're focused on partnering with academic institutions to study different psychiatric, neurological, and ophthalmic conditions through the use of virtual reality and biosensor technology. And so we'll get into a few of those biosensors um, kind of throughout this presentation. But um, for the, the scope of, of the discussion today, um, we're going to be focusing on a lot of Z3's projects related specifically to long duration space flight. Um, and so to kind of set the scene of the types of challenges that we're solving, um, I'd like everyone to kind of picture this scenario with me. Um, so I'd like you to imagine that you are in a, a medium-sized RV with three people that you just met a couple years ago, and you are hurtling through the expanse of space on your way to Mars. And if you step outside of this RV, you will freeze and be sucked into the vacuum of space. So <laughs> it's... Uh, this is basically what uh, astronauts on their way to uh, to Mars will be experiencing. Um, there are so many problems associated with this that NASA and uh, many uh, academic institutions and companies are trying to tackle today. Um, things like just the pure isolation of being in this small environment with with three other people um, away from all of your friends and family for you know eighteen to thirty months. Um, the the lack of privacy that these people will um, experience, you know, you're, there really isn't enough space to go and, um, you know, hang out in your bedroom for a while if you need to decompress. Um, the lack of novel stimulus that's uh, affiliated with the mission. So you're literally looking at the same exact thing every day when you wake up and when you go to sleep. Um, let's let's say that you get into a fight with or a, a disagreement with one of your um, you know, your, your co-pilots in this RV, um, you can't exactly leave the room. So you need to be able to address those issues um, in real time right there, which is um, hard for me at least. <laughs> I don't know if you have a different experience. And then the final thing is today on the ISS, there is pretty much instant communication um, with ground crews if something were to go wrong. Um, so if I have a, a medical issue or if, you know, that, that, 
astronaut that I'm really disagreeing with is just really getting on my nerves and I absolutely need to talk to someone. Um, well, I can do that when I'm on the ISS. When you're 30 million miles from Earth, that becomes a lot more challenging. And um, on this Martian mission, a lot of the astronauts, um, for a lot of their time, um, they're looking at communication delays to Earth that uh, will get up to you know, 40 minutes. Um, so 20 minutes to Earth and 20 minutes back. And so basically what this means is uh, NASA and others today are preparing uh, what are called countermeasures to address a lot of these um, primarily psychological issues that I just referenced. That's an area that we've been really focused on at Z3 for a while now. Um, so today I'm going to describe a few of these projects that we've uh, done primarily in partnership with the Translational Research Institute for Space Health, which is a, a consortium uh, that's run out of the Baylor College of Medicine, um, but funded by NASA, and that's based in Houston, Texas. Um, so the first thing that we tried to address in, in a project we did several years ago um, was the the isolation and confinement piece. So um, and the lack of novel stimulus. So as I mentioned, you know, you don't have any personal space, you're away from your friends and family, and um, you're seeing the same things every day, right? So one of the one of the the common things, so one of the only constants in an astronaut's day is that they have to exercise for a significant amount of time. Today it's about two hours is the recommended dose uh, of exercise. And so we saw this as the perfect opportunity to interject some of these psychological countermeasures um, into an astronaut's day through the use of VR. So what we did with Project Atlas is um, we integrated a device called the MED2, which is a miniaturized exercise device that utilizes a flywheel um, to apply pressure to a band um, as you pull it out. And so we integrated this into a virtual reality environment and created a game around it. So effectively gamifying the exercise that an astronaut would otherwise have to do every day. Um, so in this game, we're able to, um, you know, not only make exercise a little bit more fun, but we're also able to introduce a whole wide variety of different uh, natural scenes or urban environments or just new things to look at. And thus addressing part of the issue of the uh, the isolation and confinement that I referenced earlier. Um, in addition, we have another uh, we have another application within this application um, that focuses on something called meditative respiration. Um, so many people, meditation has become a, a hot button um, subject uh, as of late, and so NASA was interested in utilizing this as a way of reducing stress in their astronauts. There's there's a problem in that we need to be able to teach uh, astronauts how to uh, meditate and then also uh, be able to check if they're doing it properly um, throughout the uh, the duration of their session. And so basically what we did is we integrated a, a device that looks at tidal volumes of the lungs, which is basically like the, the, the amount of oxygen that's able to get into your lungs. So we integrated this device into a VR system. And so basically what you're seeing here on the screen is a video where as I inhale my in my lungs, you can see the entire environment is interacting with that breath. So as I inhale, everything in the environment is interacting um, and also inflating or um, all the things that you see there. So that was effectively Project Atlas. Um, we moved on then to address some of the other um, you know, neurological and ophthalmic issues that, that may occur in these long duration missions. Now, because we don't have access to uh, real time communications with flight surgeons, diagnosing neurological issues before they become mission critical is something that's extremely important to NASA and ultimately the success of the uh, of the Martian missions that are going to occur in the future. And so a phenomenal way to uh, to identify and diagnose neurological issues is actually through the eye and specifically eye movements. And so this is something that NASA is actually funded and been looking at for, for decades now out of the NASA Ames Research Center um, out in Palo Alto. And we partnered with a lab there that's uh, been pioneering this work and developed a system that is able to identify micro movements in the eye and correlate those with a variety of different neurological conditions that are relevant to these long duration spaceflight missions. Here's the challenge with what they developed. The system weighed about 80 pounds 
It occupied about 10 square feet of space in a room, and it just absolutely was not suitable for human space flight. Um, it was great, it worked on the ground, but we needed to translate that capability into something that could be utilized in the confines of that small RV that we, that we discussed earlier. And so we partnered with the lab and we went through six different iterations of, uh, of VR hardware um, to basically take all the functionality of that 80 pound system and shrink it down into the size of a VR headset. And the reason for that is obviously so we can use it in space. Um, so uh, we were successful in doing that and we actually went a little further um, and worked with uh, a partner um, up in Canada to reduce the size of the system down to the size of a pair of sunglasses that astronauts can wear um, constantly throughout the day. And so we're actually going to be piloting this functionality on uh, commercial flights in the, in, the, uh, in the coming months with partners at SpaceX and, and elsewhere. Um, so we're really excited about that work. It has massive implications both for spaceflight, but also um, for uh, you know neurology here back on Earth as well. Okay, so we had the we had the great opportunity to uh, be a part of a biomedical research team that was a part of the Inspiration Four flight that happened last year, which was the all the all civilian space flight that uh, that SpaceX launched. And as we were part of that mission, uh, the director of Trish challenged us to come up with uh, another way to support the overarching objective of the Inspiration4 flight, which was obviously to raise money for uh, for St. Jude. So she asked us to uh, utilize the same platform that we were using for uh, the eye tracking and the eye movement study that we were doing for that purpose, uh, which led us to create the Voices of Inspiration project that you can see here in this video. The incredible adventure and journey that you are on in this moment. As you go through your battle with cancer, it's just like you realize how important they are and how much they actually matter. Lift off of the Falcon 9. Hi kids, this is going to be our first time going into space. I might get homesick. Do you have any advice for me? I would love to hear about what you have learned from your experience with cancer. Hey guys, it's Tyler here. Joel here with my wife, Lindsay. That we're all underneath this great blue sky together. Every person in their heart they have kindness in it. I have learned that it's important to help others even when you have your own struggles. I think for me, I've learned not to sweat the small things. We are united and we are so thankful for you. Popcorn begins my favorite snack and I would like to see it floating around the rocket ship. Thank you, Josh. That was absolutely fascinating. And I was so moved by the Inspiration4 mission and the benefit to St. Jude's. Space Center Houston had the great fortune to actually collaborate on those experiments with Trish. And I was especially moved by the work of the uh, astronaut who was uh, representing St. Jude's. It was absolutely fantastic. I'm looking forward to talking more about that during our discussion. We'll now hear from Dylan. Great, thanks, William. And uh, thanks to Space Center Houston for this opportunity. Uh, what I would like to do is talk a little bit about storytelling. What we've heard so far by the really smart people here is uh, all of the practical uses and training and, and data that we can gather from using virtual reality. Um, what I'm going to talk a little bit about is the storytelling aspect and conveying an environment of what something is like uh, using actual um, acquired 360 uh, VR. So NASA as a whole, we try to seek out entities, documentary companies, uh, you name it, that we can tell our story. And um, for purposes of this discussion, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, Space Station and we like to um, basically um, use new technologies to try to get audiences that we haven't gotten before. So just a quick 
little memory jogger on space station. We've been up there for 22 years. We have uh, with permanent human presence. We have seven people up there currently and we're doing science every day that you can't do anywhere else. It's about the size of a US football field and it weighs uh, not quite a million pounds. So we teamed up with a virtual reality company to help us tell this story of what we do with the astronauts. So here's a shot of the camera. Uh, it has nine lenses on it um, and uh, there's eight around a circle and then one on top. And this camera uh, was up there for about two and a half years acquiring day-to-day um, -day activities on the space station. So you see we were able to attach it to an arm to be able to get unique angles because in space up is not necessarily up for the individual. It's it's very relative. You have the astronauts use four different spaces to work on in a given day. So this was a great use of communicating what this tool was like. The Earth. So we talk a lot about um, the overview effect. That's something that really it is when an astronaut or a cosmonaut first see the earth for the first time there is a profound effect on them that they are um, they realize that they are that the earth is a very fragile thing first of all by the thin atmosphere layer but that we really are one uh, human race if you will and that there's no borders they don't see borders from space so seeing that out the window uh, out the cupola with the seven different windows and being able to look around is as close as a lot of us will ever get to that. And I think this is a great tool that helps communicate to the public what that's like. So we shot a bunch of footage interior of the space station. The next step was to go out for a spacewalk. So uh, we have uh, Soichi Noguchi here and he loaded this into the Japanese airlock and they took the camera outside. The camera actually fit on the Canadarm and it was the most expensive pen tilt unit in existence, I, I think uh, in history, um, but it could give us tremendous views of space station. And so the astronauts were, were doing their spacewalks and they were able to uh, capture this in 360 VR. All right, so you see the day-to-day -day life of, of the astronauts and them uh, working and, and doing all this with this big camera that was uh, there with them. It was a tremendous feat. The, the camera, like I said, has nine different cameras on it and the amount of data that we had to get and get to the ground safely uh, without missing any bits or bytes, if you will, uh, was, was quite a challenge. So we would downlink through the communication system on the space station data so they could check and see how the different shots that they were acquiring worked. And then they would return large uh, solid state uh, hard drives uh, to them uh, on the ground so that they could have the ultimate high resolution photos. And so these are some of the external views that were, were shot. These are what they call unfolded and they are, um, if you were to put this in a VR headset, you'd be able to look around 360 and, and see the entire space station. Obviously, seeing the sun rise or sunset is uh, tremendous, um, and you get to see it in real time. What was very interesting about the, the way this was uh, captured, you were able to really get uh, an idea of what the spatial layout is of the space station in relation to um, different people, different things that you are aware of and know the size of here on the Earth. So the final product of the uh, virtual reality camera on the space station was two different things. One of them was a series of four 25 or minute so chapters um, or series, if you will, episodes of uh, being in space and talking to the astronauts and then telling them what it's like and, and isolation and talking to your family and and all of the things that they go through day to day, exercise, all of those things were put into these four 
um, different episodes. In addition to that, they created something that um, is called the infinite. And the infinite is um, very hard to explain, but we'll look at it here in just a second. But it is uh, a unique way of being able to experience space station and see it like, like you have a never before. Thank you so much, Dylan. I have personally experienced the infinite three times, and I have to say it was one of the most extraordinary experiences I've ever had. And I've also had the great fortune of visiting the VR lab at NASA Johnson Space Center and also trying out the training. And that was also absolutely amazing. So I'm a total fan and convert of the value of VR, especially for training and orientation. So I have so many questions for all three of you. This is also incredibly fascinating, but I wanted to start with Angelica, and that is, um, it's really complex to prepare for a mission. There's so many features and facets. And how do you create kind of the hierarchy for building out what the training should be? I know that astronauts train for years before they go on mission. And right now, at least with the International Space Station, it requires a lot of maintenance and repair that's really complicated. I mean, we just switched out all the batteries. You know, there, there are repairs, everything physical wears out at some point. But how do you make the decision about the hierarchy of how it should work in VR? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Um, we have an amazing team of uh, operations engineers and training engineers who actually set up what the astronaut training flow really would look like and what the astronauts need to prepare for for their specific missions. Some astronauts are trained uh, very heavily for spacewalks, so they get to experience all of the systems um, and learn and, and really train a lot on the spacewalk systems, all the EVA systems. And there's some that focus a little bit on EVA and focus a lot more on IVA, so everything that happens inside of the station. So our team really focuses on using VR for all the externals because we have powerful tools that can simulate all that graphically and immersively using virtual reality. And so we really get our feedback and our requirements from those expert teams that know the ins and outs of what the crew needs for training. Our focus, obviously, on EVA, on spacewalks, are really those three systems that I touched based on, so safer, mass handling, and robotic workstation and hardware checkout. The reason being those are the most powerful systems that we can really only use and train for using virtual reality. Yes, we have the NBL, we have the pool where they can um, physically use the hardware, physically see the, the station, but the configuration is a little bit different. The configuration in the pool does not match exactly what's up in space. The arm may not be in the right um, location. It might be kind of different just because we don't have the space in the pool for it. And so what they get in virtual reality is really that entire station configuration. We also have the ability to change 
depending on what's coming uh, for the spacewalk. So for example, if we have a SpaceX vehicle docked and a Cygnus vehicle docked and they have to go and repair or exchange some of the batteries in a mission, you know, four months in advance, we can upgrade our configuration of stations virtually and visually and provide those tools and have them ready for them to come in and train with that configuration of what station would be expected to be when they're out there. So we really get our, our requirements from the training teams and the operation team experts, but we also have the ability to reconfigure all our graphics to prepare for what's coming and what already has happened. So it's just really powerful to be able to move our configuration around without impacting any other system. Well, I have to say from my experience in the VR lab, I was doing a, a spacewalk as a portion and I was outside the space station. I decided to push myself away, started to float away. And actually I started to get vertigo because I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going out into space, but actually I was sitting in a chair. So it was actually quite powerful. So I understand the value of the lessons that one can learn so Josh, I'm really uh, fascinated by your work and expertise in the neurocognitive and how we create these impressions that are very realistic. And I I'm kind of curious if you could speak a little bit about um, how our brain actually perceives this and thinks it's, it's very real and how it kind of establishes patterns of learning, right? Because the whole point of this is to put us in scenarios that are, that are life similar so that we begin training ourselves to respond in these different situations and scenarios. So how does that work? How is it possible that we get we, we actually can learn from these kind of virtual experiences and apply them in real life? What a great question. I, you know, I, I think a, a good way to think about this is just how you learn, how you learn most of the things that we do here, like in the world, right? We're we're very spatial creatures. That we we like to touch and feel things and interact with with things at various different distances. So if you look at if you look at the way that uh, you learn things in school, for example, you have you know sheets of paper or maybe you're typing something on a computer. That's one level. Um, the next level up from that maybe is a video, and then the next level up from that, I'd argue, is a, a virtual reality experience, something where you're just introducing, you're getting as close to real life as you possibly can. Um, so I think that that's how I would respond to to that question. Um, but we're we're spatial creatures, and we like to learn things spatially. That that is so fascinating because I know that we're participating actually in collecting data in collaboration with Trish on uh, vestibular, so on balance, but using lights, a red light in one eye, green in the other, and depending on how you're, what your eye orientation is, you can, they're trying to look at predictive indicators yeah. for space sickness, right? And so it, you're it, right. It goes further than that, actually. So some of the some of the work that we're doing is looking at um, that same system through another mechanism, which is the vestibular ocular reflex. And we can actually all do an exercise right now to demonstrate what that is like, and I can talk about how that changes in space, if that would be interesting. Yeah, as long as we're not going to throw up. <laughs> no, yeah, you won't throw up. No worries. Okay, so everyone get comfy in your chair, and I want you to find a point on the screen, stare at that, and tilt your head, just backwards and forwards. So for those watching at home, you're watching the eyes of everyone on screen remain fixed on a point, despite you can stop moving your heads now. <laughs> like, <laughs> they would have gone forever. Um, so you're watching their eyes fixate on a point on the screen despite their head moving back and forth. So their eyes are moving, but they don't. it doesn't seem as if our eyes are moving as we're tilting our heads. So what's happening there is our eyes are actually in constant communication with the system that, that William just referenced, the vestibular system, which is basically you can think of this as a, a series of tubes with fluid in your inner ear. And this is what gives us our sense of balance. So when we're here on Earth and we have gravity pushing down against us, that, that fluid sits at a very specific position. So as I move my head and I close my eyes, I know my head is tilted this way and vice versa. Now, when we go up to space, some pretty crazy things happen to the system, right? We no longer have gravity pushing down on it. So that fluid is just floating in our ears. And so there's an adaptation period that needs to happen. Our brains are really plastic and they're great at adapting to different environments. So what ends up happening is 
the signals coming from our brain say, OK, no longer rely on this on this balance system that you're so used to rely only on your visual system. OK, so that that change is something that we're studying with that eye tracking system that I, I referenced earlier because it's different in all of us and we're not really sure why yet. So the rate at which I change and adapt is different than you, William, and we need to be able to figure out how long someone is going to be in that period of you know, not being able to balance and potentially having space motion sickness, which is another issue altogether. So hopefully that gives a little more color there. Oh, well, that's absolutely fascinating. And I think that's a perfect transition to Dylan because uh, you know, the work that that was done to create that amazing immersive experience, the infinite. And I, as I mentioned, I'd expect I had the good fortune of doing it three times. And you know, after my first time, I was um, as fascinated by other people and how they responded. And it was quite individual. There were some people who actually had to go sit down because they were overstimulated by it. They were, um, you know, they thought they were going to fall off into the darkness of space. And others who were uh, just so excited and motivated and wanted to touch every sphere to hear the testimony of the astronauts and the visual representation was so incredible. The 360 working so beautifully. So I'm, I'm wondering what you hope the outcome or the impact will be of, of someone going through an experience like the infinite. With the infinite. You know, it really gave folks a, a, a an idea of what it's like to be on the space station. And uh, give you an example, I talked to an astronaut after he had um, actually gone through and he came out with his tears coming down his eyes and he says, that's the closest I've been since I've been there to what it was like because it gave him all that, the spatial relationships and all of the uh, 360 sound and all of the things that uh, gave him all of these cues to his sensors that allowed him to do it. And so I think what's really, um, the more and more that people experience this, it's gonna give them the opportunity to um, see what space is like, first of all. And then on top of that, being able to go somewhere that maybe you've never gone before. And, may, and that's not just space, it could be a race car, it could be a mountaintop, it could be whatever it is. But being able to to see it uh, like that in that quality uh, is uh, tremendous. So Angelica, I'm curious about other applications of this technology. And I, I think it's really interesting. All three of you referenced gaming platforms and how really gaming revolutionized the ability to use VR, about popularize it, but also uh, you're using a lot of, if you will, the platforms, right, in order to animate the, the things that we're, we're learning and doing uh, with real life experiences. And uh, I, I'm wondering actually how you got interested in this. How did it, how is it that you come to be a leader in the virtual reality lab at NASA Johnson Space Center? Were you a gamer as a kid? Interestingly enough, I was not a gamer. <laughs> I'm still not a gamer. I actually own a couple of headsets, but my boyfriend's actually the avid gamer in this household. All of my coworkers love video games. They grew up with them. Um, my interest in VR actually started in college. So it was a little a little later um, and it was introduced to by simulation. I actually went to school for aerospace and I thought I wanted to work with airplanes. Uh, as a career forever. And then I got the opportunity to intern um, at an aerospace company. And it, it wasn't that I didn't like it, I just did not love it. So I decided to pursue a master's degree and I was really interested in simulation. Um, one of my internships at the aerospace company was simulation software and I loved it. I wanted to dig deeper into that. So I got into that world and then turned into training. So simulation software for training, I was still really interested in aerospace. So uh, the life changing moment for me was an internship with Langley Research Center where I got to explore virtual reality. I got to get my hands on an Oculus and a Vive and get to do some simulation work with VR. And that's when I knew that's what I had to do. I knew that I needed to make space with 
um, simulation, with training, with VR. Uh, so I just started looking at any possibilities of mixing all of that. And that's really what ended up bringing me here. Um, so I consider myself really lucky to be able to mix all of them and what I do every single day for work. Um, so that was kind of my past. My past passion was never really video games or VR alone. It was everything in the background. So for me, VR is just a cherry on top of it, which is great. Well, I imagine a little sci-fi sci because I see Baby Yoda in the background there. So. <laughs> <laughs> so Josh, how about for you? And how did how did you did you were you more in neurosciences? How did you kind of have this marriage or this combination of you know the VR area with the neurological sciences? How did how did that come about for you? Yeah, I have I have a really, really strange background in this field. So I actually um <laughs> believe it or not, I did not graduate college. Um, so I actually dropped out of school my sophomore year to go work at a neurotechnology company in Houston called BrainCheck. And at BrainCheck, um, you know, I started there as an intern and I was doing all of the tasks that no one wanted to do. That was my strategy for moving up in the company. And um, at the end of my internship, uh, the CEO offered me a, a full time role that I uh, with the caveat that I had to take a gap year um, to, to, you know, fulfill the project. And so I, I ended up doing that. The The idea was always to go back to school afterwards and, you know, just I'll just do this for a year. Um, but three months into that, I got promoted again and I took leadership over the, the entire product team there at that company. Um, we launched two products. Um, one was to diagnose traumatic brain injury, so concussions. Um, and the other was to diagnose early stage dementia um, through the use of a, an iPhone game effectively. And so I did that for about a year and a half, and then at that company, I met two um, people who are now my co-founders at Z3. We were all uh, enthusiasts in in virtual reality. We we had the very early versions of all of the like the Oculus DK1 and and the Vive and everything. Um, and you know, in these little gamer sessions that we had after work, we really saw the future, not just of gaming but also of healthcare, which I hope we can get into a little bit. Um, in, in a few moments, but um, that's what really kind of sparked the interest, and, and that's why we're in this field today, um, was all the way back then. So, yeah. Wow, fascinating trajectory. And Dylan, uh, you have a huge purview working with both commercial crew, international space station, in a field that's changing dramatically. How have you, uh, how have you arrived at this point in your career? So, um, I started out, I, I, when we talked earlier, I said storytelling. And that's really, I, I've i been using, um, ever since college, new technologies to tell stories differently. When I uh, first started in college, it was with high definition television. We used to have the old uh, cathode ray tube, you know, televisions and, and low resolution compared to what we have now. But um, I evolved my storytelling through high definition, uh, 4K UHD, and then the, a, a logical progression um, was to try to uh, also do storytelling with 360 uh, 3D VR uh, as well. And so all through my career, I've been trying to, you know, you always have to push hard to get people to change from one technology to the next. And so I was kind of an early adopter in a lot of those things. And um, I think we're, we're going to see a real um, surge in people wanting to see uh, VR here in the in the very near future. Well, it's clear you've all followed your passions and that is so motivating. And I always give that counsel when when people ask me about what they should do in life or what their career should be, I always say you've got to find your passion and you find it through exploring and trying things out and seeing what really, really motivates you. Um, I wanted to, to pivot a little bit to something, uh, some work, Josh, that you're doing with Nicole Stott um, related to um, St. Jude's and, and healthcare, and wonder how is it that you connected with Nicole? She's an incredible astronaut artist, and we actually work closely with her on a project to and with Dover LLC to create spacesuits. And the, the cancer pediatric cancer patients actually painted triangles, and they were woven together. We actually premiered the exhibit at Space Center Houston, 
and it was so motivating for our visitors and gave people so much hope. And it was fabulous to see them on Space Station. How is it that you connected with Nicole and, and tell us a little bit about the project you worked on, the VR project related to working with uh, pediatric cancer patients? Yeah, definitely. So, um, you know, when I, I referenced this earlier, um, when we were working with the Inspiration4 crew um, and Trish, and, you know, we were really challenged to uh, to utilize VR as a platform, as, as we've all kind of been saying. Um, not just to look at uh, eye movements through our research, but what else could we use that VR headset that we were flying um, on this this commercial space flight for? And so, you know, that's th that was effectively the charter and the challenge that we got from the director of Trish is what else can you do with this thing? And so we really leaned into the uh, the objective of of Inspiration Four, which was ultimately to raise money for St. Jude and and also to inspire the kids um, that were there in their facilities. And so, you know, the, one of the first phone calls we made was to Nicole, because this is an area that um, there are very few people that have done more um, at the intersection of art and space than Nicole Stott. Um, and she is a phenomenal human being, we found out um, after many calls with her. Um, and so, you know, we, we really, we, we spent several sessions kind of going back and forth on different ideas. And through those discussions, we realized that the journey that these astronauts were about to go on and that we're you know preparing for really had a lot of the same features as the journey of a pediatric cancer patient and that's something that you know when nicole first said that we were like that makes no sense at all i i don't understand it in one bit but then she started explaining the specifics she was like think about it these are not trained astronauts that have been thinking about this their entire life, one of them just got a call nine months ago and is now an astronaut, you know, with, in Haley's case. And so there's the fear of the unknown that's associated with going to space. When you get there, we talked earlier about the isolation from your friends and family. Absolutely, especially during COVID, something that these, these kids had to deal with. Um, you're eating strange food that you didn't make for yourself. That happens up there as well. Um, you're exposed to higher levels of radiation. This list goes very long. And that was the impetus towards um, actually asking the astronauts to ask the kids for advice on their own journey that they were about to go on. So that was that was why the, the questions that you saw there um, were asked by the astronauts. But the ultimate objective of the project was to get these, you know, to, to have these kids explain their experience and respond to these questions, providing insight to the astronauts. But ultimately, we wanted this to be a tool for future children coming through the St. Jude system that are about to start on their journey, that have all the same questions that these astronauts do um, about the, the fear of the unknown and all of the other things that, that they responded to. So um, that that's kind of the uh, the impetus of the project and I really appreciate you giving me airtime to to discuss it because it was a, a really fun thing to work on. Well it's interesting and that's I think it's something that's so amazing about space exploration is it's so relatable. People think oh no I could never be an astronaut or I would never go into space or why do we invest in the space program but I think over and over again we are the greatest beneficiaries of either research that happens or insights that we gain as humans. So I wanted to pivot to Dylan because I think you have one of the toughest jobs because there are so many cool things happening with the space station and now with commercial crew as the private sector, you know, is growing so rapidly around exploration and collaborating with NASA, but also pursuing their own interests and building on NASA's expertise and experience. How do you determine what to share with the public, how to put out their um, around the, you know, among the multitude of fascinating projects and initiatives underway? And it's a great question. Um, it's, it's a balance between two things. First of it, you've got to give them something that they can uh, relate to, but maybe it's in a different environment that they're not used to. We released a video a number of years ago of uh, Karen Nyberg washing her hair in space and her hair was way off the top of her head and she's explaining how she does it all and all of that. Someone could relate to that, but it was so different in microgravity. So I think uh, it, more and more we're going to see a lot of um, 
people trying to to show different things that we've never seen before but you're you were asking really you know how do we decide what to show and that's the hard part is because you've got you've got something that someone can relate to and then there's also something we've never seen before and that's what we have a lot of we have a lot of science we have a lot of um, things that uh, phenomena and different things that occur that um, people uh, really should see and it is it is not a trivial job we get down we have nine channels of video that come down from the space station every day and about 75 to 80 percent of the time we have communication coverage and we're getting video down and the question is how do you sift through that and find those golden nuggets to communicate hey this is what your space program is doing for you and and that is something that we we constantly um are, are refining and sharpening our pencils to try to figure out the best way to do it so I wonder, you know, Artemis is intended to be a proving ground, right, for ultimately sending humans onto Mars. And this takes a lot of work and preparation. And so Angelica, are you beginning to work on simulations for Mars or modeling for the moon that's going to be relevant to when we go on to Mars? I mean, I, I know Josh spoke a little bit about this and, and you did as well. Mars is really far away and we know <laughs> we're going to have to be Earth independent. And so there's so many things we've got to figure out you know, there's a different level of gravity there, what three eighths compared to Earth. And, you know, the moon is one thick, so our bodies are going to respond in kind of a different way. Everything, all of our systems and just our, you know, physiological movements and, and everything and how our bodies adapt will be very, very different. Are you beginning to look at kind of VR to help orient astronauts to potential for a human mission to Mars? We're trying. Um, we are trying to start setting up all our systems to be sustainable enough to not just support moon missions, but also Mars and beyond. Right. We are trying to figure out what the best game engine is to go forward that's sustainable and and we can scale up those simulations for not just the moon and different landing sites and different terrains and different lighting conditions, but also how can we you know take a step further and once we get ready for the moon how can we take that terrain and easily adapt it in the systems that we already have and we're also trying to prove how we can integrate all of those technologies right we want to be able to stimulate microgravity so we want to be able to help them figure out communication we want to be able to maybe launch you know better vr systems into space um, and there's so many limitations and so many struggles that we deal with, even maintaining and supporting the current hardware that we have today, um, especially VR that's changing every other year, right? Uh, so we are really trying hard to standardize some of those things and make those processes a lot easier so that in the future, if someone wants to send, you know, a Quest 5, uh, it's a lot easier to just get certified and sent to flight and load whatever application we need to load for either astronaut training or entertainment or, you know, physical activity and and whatever it is the application is. So we're, we're really trying. Um, it's hard. Space is really hard. Space bugs are really hard. And getting to the moon is definitely closer than it was. Uh, but we're actively working on making sure that we have the right platforms in place to be able to support those missions for sure. Well, I think it's amazing just to see in a decade how the um, hardware for VR has evolved because it used to be these massive headsets and then hearing you, Josh, talk about something that's now down to the size of a pair of glasses. And of course, we've had Google Glass as well, right? There are these new technologies that are always being developed uh, that are becoming more and more efficient. And I thought it was absolutely fascinating and helicopter for you to talk about ongoing training using VR because you always think about astronauts get trained and they go to space and they do their mission. They're already trained. Yet, no, there are changes and this can be a way to keep their skills sharp and to prepare them for something that happens because things always go wrong in space exploration, right? You prepare, 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 uh, but something's always going to go kaflui or not the way you expect it. And so this could be a really incredible tool. Um, so um, it's it's absolutely fascinating. Um, I am would love to continue speaking with all three of you, but we've reached the end of our time. It has gone by so quickly. 
And I really want to thank all three of you for being part of our conversation today. The work you're doing is absolutely fascinating and life changing and really want to, to give all of three of you, you know, kudos for how you're changing the world and people's lives and impacting them with the work you're doing. Uh, so I really appreciate you being part of our program today. I want to close out by saying to thank all of uh, our viewers as well for joining us. And we hope you enjoy this episode of Space Center Houston's Thought Leader Series. And please go to our website at spacecenter.org to see our blog or follow our social media to learn more about upcoming programs and other activities at Space Center Houston. We look forward to seeing you at a future episode. Thank you.